This presentation is brought to you by the MFOA. Hello everyone, welcome to MFOA's webinar entitled Social Housing 101 Webinar Series, Social Housing Challenges Now and on the Horizon. Social Housing 101 is a two-part webinar series whereby part one was delivered last Wednesday, October 15th. You can still access the free webinar on our on-demand section of the MFOA website should you decide to learn more about social housing fundamentals for municipal finance staff. And now I'd like to introduce to you your presenters. Eric Freiler has been working in the affordable and social housing fields for over 30 years, most of which has been with the provincial government. Prior to her current employment with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Erin Mifflin worked in the municipal housing field for seven years with the City of Hamilton. Both Eric and Erin work in the Ministry's Infrastructure and Asset Management Units of the Housing Funding and Risk Management Branch. Deb Schlichter joined the Region of Waterloo as Director of Housing in June 2009 and is currently responsible for a portfolio of approximately 9,000 community housing units that are either owned or overseen by the region and is responsible for implementing the Region of Waterloo's affordable housing strategy which to date has helped create over 2,000 new units of affordable housing in the community. Previously, Deb spent 25 years working in the non-for-profit sector with 11 years as Executive Director of House of Friendship, a local multi-service charitable organization serving those living in poverty. Deb also served three terms on the Board of Directors of the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association, where she held several roles including President and Past President and has been involved in a number of housing and homelessness networks. Deb's passion is housing with the belief that everyone needs a place to call home. Elba Michelucci has been involved with the financial side of housing programs for the past 20 years. In 1993, she was with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, London office, until 2000 where she joined the Finance Department at the Region of Waterloo. Elba has served as treasurer for nonprofits including Housing in the Home Community and has participated in a number of housing initiatives such as MMAH benchmarks and funding models. Most recently, Elba is the financial lead of the Housing Collaborative in Initiative, which is a consortium of eight municipalities working collaboratively to develop and implement a financial and administrative solution to deliver a service manager housing system. We're very excited to have them here with us today. Thank you, and let's get started. Eric? Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, I want to welcome people who have... Uh, who are new to this webinar series. As was mentioned, this is the second of two webinars. Uh, I understand there's a few more people on this one than there were in the previous one. And I'd like to welcome back those that uh, had joined us a week ago in webinar one. Uh, on the first uh, slide, you'll see that today's webinar is going to be focusing um, on challenges and opportunities. Um, I also, before I go on, I'd like to thank the MFOA for uh, supporting us and making this webinar available, and of course, um, being able to provide us with a tremendous uh, technical and uh, su um, support uh, to make it possible, and to let its members know that uh, this uh, webinar is on. And of course, I'd like to tell, uh, thank Deb and Alba and the Region Waterloo for assisting us with this. Um, on to this. Uh, first, before we start off into today's webinar, I just want to um, identify that this is generally what you're getting is a general overview of social housing as it is today. Uh, social housing, the concepts are pretty simple, but implementing it, uh, implementing it can get kind of complex. We don't include all the details, um, although we include probably a lot more than you probably thought we should have, at least in the first one. Uh, and we don't take into account local facts and circumstances. So. Given that uh, we're going to be referencing laws and practices that are subject to change, municipalities are best advised to be uh, ensure that they take responsibility for their own decisions, and we strongly recommend you consult your own legal advisors and experts when appropriate. Okay, that's our statute of limitations. On the next slide, we'll have an outline of what um, today's webinar is about. Um, it's uh, a little less detailed than we had in the first one, but we will. For those who weren't involved in the first one, we'll give you a very quick recap of what we discussed last week. And for those that were there, this will be just a little reminder. Uh, today's webinar is going to focus mostly on the social housing challenges and opportunities. So looking forward, some things we're going to discuss 
the service level standards, the decreasing and eventual end of federal funding, a look at the physical stock and social housing in general as an infrastructure item uh, that municipalities are, uh, are uh, dealing with, as well as asset management, and opportunities for municipal service managers to readjust operational subsidies and finances in the future. Also, we'll have a look at the housing providers, what issues and opportunities they're going to be facing um, as we go forward. On the next slide, I'll give you a very brief recap um, of last week's webinar. So, what is social housing? Most, I mean, essentially what it is, it's rental housing that's affordable, adequate, and suitable for people with low and moderate income. Uh, an important feature of social housing and what distinguishes it from the current programs called affordable housing is that there are um, the rent, there are units available to uh, eligible households who pay rent geared to income units, so-called RGI units. That means that for eligible households, they'll be paying no more than 30% of their monthly income for rent. This is a slight difference in the current programs, the, the uh, uh, affordable housing programs, where rents are um, based on 80% of average market rent. It's not, an, uh, it's not based on a household's income. Social housing units fall under the legal authority of the current Housing Services Act 2011, as well as there's an agreement between Ontario and the federal government uh, through Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, which is called the Canada-Ontario Social Housing Agreement. We'll talk about that more. Uh, that has implications for municipalities in terms of what is contained in that agreement. And we recognize and we want to bring up front that we know that service managers and municipalities pay almost two-thirds of the total cost of social housing across Ontario. Now, social housing, it's worth noting, is several decades old. Uh, nothing new has been built since uh, 1995, but it started in the late 40s and 50s. So you'll notice, that it's a, you'll note that it's a real mixed bag of various programs over the years, and there are fine nuances and differences between them. Uh, there's different kinds of social housing is that, in that there are former Ontario Housing Corporation units which were um, um, brought over to municipal level during the local services realignment as well as municipal and private nonprofits, cooperatives. There are still projects that were developed and op currently operating under federal programs that are still being administered by the federal government, as well as some that are operating under what were former provincial unilateral projects that have no federal involvement at all. Most of the social housing is geared to income, but there are some market units as well. And generally, those units in social housing tend to be on the lower end of market. Uh, there's about 260,000 social housing units in Ontario, and um, about 180,000 of that are RGI units. The next slide, I'll go very briefly over the history of social housing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the federal government constructed social housing for, what, as I mentioned earlier, a number of decades, almost 60 years. In 1993, the federal government decided there would be no further federal dollars committed for social housing. In 1995, a same decision was made by the Ontario government. Um, as I mentioned, that's when the last social housing project was committed, the last new one. In 1999, Canada Ontario signed um, the social housing agreement, which transferred the administrative responsibility for most, uh, almost all, of the social housing from the federal government to the provincial government. And the province of Ontario did a similar activity in 2001 when we transferred social housing to municipalities uh, identified as service areas through the Social Housing Reform Act 2000. Uh, this act has since been replaced by the Housing Services Act 2011. On the next slide, uh, we'll talk, I'll talk just briefly about um, the roles uh, of the key players having to do with social housing. Obviously, the federal government through Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation um, provides funds for existing federal and federal provincial social housing projects, those that have been built under previous programs. In most cases, although not all, the uh, CMHC will provide National Housing Act mortgage insurance, which enables housing providers to get um, um, uh, mortgages through private lenders at a, a very good rate because it lowers um, the risk to private lenders through the, uh, if the insurance is in place. And so CMHC also provides direct lending in the form of mortgages to social housing projects. There's about 2,900 today 
2,900 mortgages uh, still uh, in effect for social housing. About half of that is through private lenders and half of that is through CMHC direct loan and, uh, lending. The provincial role is we've defined that more clearly, I think, in the recent um, Housing Services Act legislation. The province sees itself as a steward of housing and homelessness issues. Um, we have a very practical function as well in that we have a mortgage renewal function um, where uh, as mortgages uh, and terms end, we will bundle existing mortgages, take them out to the capital market uh, for tender, and um, usually that results in a very competitive uh, interest rate for the successful uh, lender. And that will reflect itself in lower monthly payments by providers and uh, obviously to service managers who provide those subsidies. Um, also, the province sets the policies and the legislation insofar as how social housing, um, the framework for social housing, the provisions and ongoing operation of social housing across the province. Um, also, we have retained since the last legislation, uh, Housing Services Act, still some interest in ministerial consent. In other words, the province has to consent to very specific activities that happen uh, in the social housing world. Uh, for example, if a uh, housing, uh, the service manager and a housing provider um, wish to sell housing stock, the consent to do that would have to come from the provincial government. Um, however, most other forms of consent are, have now been, uh, in, as of the last legislation, brought down to the municipal level. Of course, the service managers, municipal service managers, including um, DSABs, uh, have a, a major role. Uh, they actually administer and fund, as we mentioned, two-thirds of the social housing costs in Ontario. Uh, they actually deliver the housing and homelessness programs. And um, uh, also, under legislation, uh, uh, annually or uh, every few years, uh, develop housing and homelessness plans. As I mentioned earlier, are now responsible for a number of service managers' consent that must be given to housing providers if they want to do specific things like refinance finance their existing mortgage or deal with easements on title, those sorts of things. And of course, there are the social housing providers. Those are the um, co-op boards, the nonprofit boards, the church groups. 55% of the social housing, in fact, is owned by municipalities directly or indirectly. So uh, some municipalities are also have a dual role as a provider. And the providers are uh, we expect them to work closely with service managers. On the next slide, I'll go very quickly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there, there are the, some legislation agreements in, uh, with respect to social housing. The big one from our perspective is the social housing agreement between Ontario and the federal government through CMHC. Um, as I mentioned, it was outlined the responsibility the province has in terms of the ongoing administration and funding of the um, various programs that were devolved from the federal government to us. It has an impact on municipalities only insofar as there are some aspects of the social housing agreement that we've integrated into the legislation. Uh, specifically, one thing uh, may, that may come up from time to time is a so-called uh, Clause 9D, where we've indemnified the federal government for all costs associated with social housing. And that means if uh, any social housing project that's uh, either insured under the National Housing Act or that is um, exists on what was social housing program land, um, as long as there's a federal involvement in that project, if there's any cost to the federal government um, over and above program costs, we're responsible for repaying them. Uh, not surprisingly, we had a similar uh, clause in the Housing Services Act with respect to municipal service uh, um, managers reimbursing the province for any provincial uh, costs incurred. So, um, that's a relevant part of the FHA. The long-term affordable housing strategy is a fairly new undertaking. I think it's the first of its kind in Ontario. We developed it a little over a year ago. Uh, the intent is to be able to look at the larger picture uh, in Ontario and in a municipal level for improving outcomes for people through housing and homelessness initiatives. It also introduced the Housing Services Act, which was uh, now a little over a year old as well. Um, the Act I think more clearly defines the provincial role as one of steward, but there are admittedly still some sections of the HSA that are fairly prescriptive in terms of how uh, 
service managers must deal their housing providers in that um, there are certain processes that have to be followed if the project is in, uh, experiencing difficulty or if a service manager wants to make changes to a nonprofit board, those sorts of things. And obviously the province is now um, in the middle of enacting its strategy on the poverty, uh, Ontario poverty reduction. And obviously social housing plays a role in that. On the next slide, we'll go very briefly again and recap of webinar one. The Money Matters section, we identified uh, the social housing subsidies, how it works. Uh, we transfer the federal subsidies that we receive to municipalities every quarter. Um, in when um, local services realignment and through the first bit of legislation, we also establish benchmarks, operating subsidy benchmarks for each and every project at the time. And those are the minimum subsidy levels that the province has established that municipal services uh, municipal service managers have to maintain. Uh, benchmarks are adjusted slightly with respect to specifically utilities um, every year, and those uh, adjustments are based on the consumer price uh, index for that previous year. Also, the province uses uh, how it determines how every municipal service manager gets the federal subsidies is based on a federal uh, funding distribution model. Um, based Basically, that model uses the costs that were in place in 2001, and on a go-forward basis, uh, basis um, the amount of uh, federal subsidy that every service manager gets is based on the percentage of the total provincial social housing units. What percentage that municipal that service manager had is the percentage they would get of the federal subsidies. Um, we um, publish those publicly through the Ontario Gazette. And we always um, uh, forecast five years in advance. So every year we update the fifth year so that municipalities have a, uh, some five years worth of um, planning that they can make that they know they can count on uh, the amount. They'll know exactly what federal subsidies they'll be receiving for the next five years. And I mentioned earlier, we also do have a centralized mortgage renewal function, um, which um, allows private lenders to bid on bundles of mortgages as they come uh, renewed. And it usually results in quite um, impressive, I believe, uh, um, competitive rates on the mortgages and should reduce uh, provider monthly costs and service manager subsidies. I'd like to um, have you go to the next slide and bring it over to Erin Mifflin, who will walk you through the next portion. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everybody. Um, we now would like to have a discussion about social housing challenges and opportunities. And um, first and foremost, an important uh, component of this discussion uh, <clears throat> relates to service level standards, which are the minimum number of rent geared to income units and modified units in a service manager area. And this is based on the number of RGI and modified units that were transferred from the province to the service managers at the time of transfer. And as per the Housing Services Act, province does expect service managers to maintain these minimum levels of RGI units. The province has a continued interest in ensuring there's a minimum supply of affordable and social housing and we'll continue to monitor how this public asset is used now and in the future, keeping in mind that there's been a significant amount of public dollars invested in this asset over the years. Um, we encourage service managers to seek legal advice to understand their obligations under the Housing Services Act. And just as a reminder, service level standards include both bricks and mortar as well as rent supplement units. It's whatever the service manager had at the time of transfer. Moving on to the next slide, uh, the decreasing and eventual end of federal funding. Uh, I just want to preface the, the remarks of this slide by saying that, as we mentioned in the first webinar, even though block funding um, was calculated on a project by project basis, federal funding is block funding. Service managers can allocate their federal funding however they choose so long as the money is used in accordance with the Housing Services Act and meets all of its funding obligations to housing providers. That is, from an accounting standpoint, it doesn't matter whether a service manager uses all of its federal funding on public housing and uses its own money to cover nonprofit subsidies or, or vice versa. Um, a challenge for service managers is that the offsets are declining and service managers are paying more which will likely uh, result in an increase to the net levy costs for service managers. The Fed's 
have historically been an important partner with the province in funding social and affordable housing. And uh, the province, together with other provinces and territories, have been advocating for the feds to be a long-term funding partner in housing. Um, federal funding for existing social housing stock will decline from about $470 million today to zero by 2033. And as federal funding declines, service managers might want to consider to review their portfolio in order to respond to the Housing Services Act service level standards for social housing. Um, anecdotally, we've heard that some nonprofits will be fine without federal funding. For example, projects that don't receive federal funding now and only pay off, have to pay off their mortgages, for example, provincial unilaterals. This is theoretical, but in reality it could be difficult as provincial unilaterals have high levels of RGIs. Um, provincial projects generally are reliant on receiving ongoing subsidies due to their number of RGIs. Federal projects with little or no rent geared to income units that are mostly lower end of market are generally thought to be in good condition without federal funding. And on the next slide, you'll see a, a repeat of the graph we had in the first webinar, but we think it's important because it shows the decline in federal funding over the years. Um, some service managers will experience a decline in federal funding earlier than others. Depends on where you are and uh, what programs were used to fund your social housing projects. Generally, though, um, service managers who are located in older urban areas will feel the impact sooner as they tended to participate in the earliest social housing programs. Uh, and a good example of that is public housing. Uh, continuing on to the next slide, uh, we talk more about the end of federal funding. As Eric mentioned, um, based on 2013 uh, funding, municipalities paid approximately two-thirds of the cost of social housing. Um, looking at uh, the end of federal funding will also be expiring long-term operating agreements and associated subsidies. Projects may or may not be sustainable post-subsidy. Um, in some projects, subsidies might decline because mortgages or debentures are ending. For example, a federal project where the operating agreement terminates when the mortgage is paid off. And there are some providers who won't be able to sustain the same number of RGI units on their own. In other cases, such as debenture financed public housing and provincial projects that are subject to Part 7 of the Housing Services Act, the obligation for the service manager to pay a subsidy continues, albeit at a lower rate, even after the financing is paid off. That said, providers could still have financial challenges for other reasons, such as rising capital costs. Uh, municipalities are starting to undertake assessments on sustainability of their social housing stock on a portfolio-wide basis. What happens when operating agreements end is an important discussion to have. Uh, we don't recommend you wait until the last minute. Uh, try and engage your providers as early as possible and figure out uh, their intentions and, and service manager obligations, if there are any. Um, some sector organizations have developed tools to assess the viability of their projects, and we'll get into tools and resources that are available a little later on in the presentation. Unlike the physical stock, where there are options to carry on through leveraging the asset or readjusting the rent, um, federal rent supplements will not continue on without a new source of funds. And on the next slide, we're looking specifically at uh, the physical stock, the bricks and mortar legacy. Um, an important consideration for our aging social housing stock is, are they still meeting present needs? Um, building and land have value. What are the implications for borrowing for capital projects, repairs, renewal needs, or should sale and replacement be considered? Equity in a property can only be unlocked if a provider can prove it can afford the carrying cost of a refinancing arrangement. Will specific projects or buildings be quote unquote sustainable post subsidy? Uh, this really speaks to the need for strategic assets, uh, property management, energy audits, in, in order to make the best decisions about uh, which part of the social housing bricks and mortar portfolio to keep and which maybe to consider not keeping. On the next slide, we talk more about uh, the physical stock and social housing as infrastructure. As we mentioned uh, in the first webinar, approximately 55% of all social housing in Ontario is owned directly by municipalities or through municipally owned uh, housing corporations. As with all municipally owned assets, it may be ben beneficial to have an infrastructure renewal and replacement plan in place for municipally owned um, social housing. And ideally, uh, municipally owned social housing should be included in broader municipal discussions about infrastructure as it responds to future needs of future uh, residents 
And this was uh, this notion was introduced in the building together uh, infrastructure strategy that Ontario introduced. It's a 10-year infrastructure strategy. It does include municipally owned social housing as a key component of municipal infrastructure. And it's mandated that on a go-forward basis, uh, municipalities across the province must develop and implement asset management plans in order to ex access provincial funding for infrastructure projects. Um, in the past, the province has provided funding and support for asset management, physical stock, and social housing through the Social Housing Repair and Retrofit Program, otherwise known as SHRP. Um, the feds and province provided $350 million each for social housing capital repairs through uh, 2009 to 2011 through the Federal Economic Stimulus Initiative. And a, a much smaller program, but more strategic in nature, was <clears throat> the Social Housing Asset Management Program, or SHAMP. And the province is providing $750,000 over three years to small to medium-sized service managers um, for investment in strategic asset management initiatives, such as software, updating building condition assessments, or staff training. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we're talking about some asset management. Um, we, we're, when we speak with service managers, uh, we're, we're always talking about the pros of um, making the case for project-specific um, and strategic real estate asset management. In um, our view, project-specific asset management, it's important to assess at this level, uh, and then you can look at asset management more broadly on a portfolio-wide basis. And you can consider issues such as where could market rents be maximized, where could or should market units be introduced if they haven't been before? Um, are there projects where hard decisions need to be made? Are they viable? Um, maybe they're in the, the bottom 5% of your portfolio. Uh, where is it most feasible to have rent supplement units? Uh, and just as a reminder about service level standards, it's silent on bricks and mortar or rent supplements. Um, even if a decision is made to dispose one or more assets, the value of those assets can still be recycled. Um, effective long-term asset management plans are an important step in maintaining and extending the life of the existing social housing stock. And the ministry has worked with partners and stakeholders through asset management working groups to develop tools for providers and service managers to undertake asset management for, um, planning. And uh, examples of this are um, recently we uh, <clears throat> developed a redevelopment guide, which is available on our website. If you haven't seen it yet, we'd be happy to send you the link. Um, HSC, through the Asset Management Center, published the FRAME document, which is an excellent resource. And uh, the ministry continues to work with Housing Services Corporation on asset management issues and also with MFOA on things like this webinar. Um, the condition of the asset will vary project by project, obviously. Uh, it's also important to consider rising utility costs when you're looking at asset management. Um, there can be capital pressures in projects even before federal funding ends. So it's important to have things in good shape now. Um, and Deb, I'm not sure if you wanted to jump in here. I was going to add about uh, what we've done here at the region of Waterloo is that we've covered the cost of doing building condition assessments for all of our housing providers, including our own uh, regionally owned stock, the old Ontario Housing Corporation stock. It does cost a bit of money to do that. So every five years, uh, we, we cover that full cost so that all of the providers are getting the same, um, they're on the same time frame. We use the same tool across all of the providers, so that makes it easier for us as a service manager to keep track of uh, how, how um, their building assets are doing, uh, what the key, key issues are. But we also, at the same time, do a bit of an energy efficiency um, audit, and we also include our capital reserve assessment. So we get a sense of how well their capital reserves are going to be able to cover the kind of things that are going to be coming up for them in terms of repairs. So it's, it's a really helpful way for us to be on top of the issue. How short are we going to be around capital reserves in the future and what kind of um, solutions are we going to be putting in place for that? Wonderful. Thanks very much, Deb. Uh, now on the next slide, I'm going to pass it back over to Eric, who's going to talk about refinancing challenges and opportunities. Um, social housing, <laughs> excuse me, by its very nature, is a very difficult business to refinance because your revenue stream uh, is intentionally low. That means it's working well with social housing. It does, however, make it very difficult 
to get refinancing. And um, because of the limited limited revenue stream, um, there are some limits as to what you can, uh, or there there's extra caution has to be taken in, when approaching the lender for refinancing. Uh, specifically, you know, you have to look, have you maximized your total revenue? Now, not the non-rental revenue, uh, is it reasonable to look at increasing uh, the market revenue? Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're looking to sort of unlock the equity that you have in that stock and approach a lender for uh, refinancing, increasing the financing or extending the amortization period, the lender's going to have a long, hard look at your ability to be able, the provider's ability to be able to cover the new cost. Um, there are other challenges. Uh, social housing wasn't always located in the most valuable uh, part of town, although in many cases, social housing is now in the middle of great parts of uh, redeveloped uh, areas and municipalities, so land values are sort of hard to judge. Um, there are still some constraints, obviously, in terms of what you can um, do with refinancing, because to some extent under the social housing agreement between CMHC and the province, and um, in terms of requiring consent, and as I mentioned earlier, some of the contingent liabilities. But there are also some challenges because the types of mortgages, by and large, on you know, social housing projects, are um, you're not going to be able to make changes to those mortgages mid-term. Um, although there is considerable flexibility, I believe, when, uh, uh, in, when you're renewing at the end of the term to either increase or prepay. Um, for private lenders, um, midterm it's impossible because these mortgages are locked in through mortgage-backed security um, plans. Um, so that's why we got the great rates. Is there's a downside to that. CMHC as a lender, um, it, their mortgages are sort of vary quite a bit. Some mortgages have terms of 10 years. Some mortgages actually have terms of 50 years. So there's no touching that for, until the mortgage actually. Um, retired. Uh, but there again, um, for those mortgages, when they get renewed, um, if there are changes you want to make to the amount or the extent, it would be at the time of renewal. But in between renewal times, it's virtually impossible. Now having spoken to, um, and some of the other challenges, because the revenue stream is so low, we've seen some interesting refinancing uh, exercises undertaken by service managers and providers in the last little while. Um, but in cases, in some cases, where you want to um, refinance for a longer amortization period, lenders have been sort of nervous about the period of time um, where if there's an operating agreement in place where the agreement expires. So um, they've asked service managers to also um, increase the length of time, or to commit to increase the length of time that they'll provide subsidies. Again, every circumstance has its quirks and there are differences. There are also great opportunities, um, uh, as you may well imagine. There's actually quite a lot of value in the properties. And once the uh, mortgages are expired, in some cases, um, the, and the, there are no federal subsidies. For example, the provincial unilateral projects, um, which where mortgages will expire in the next 20 years, there's no federal subsidy to that. The service managers are paying the total subsidy. So in some cases, there may be some very positive cash flow if there aren't a high number of RGI units. But in many cases, we know that there's still the ongoing, uh, even once mortgages are retired, there are going to be ongoing costs to ensure that the RGI levels are still being met. Um, we are pulling together now, uh, and we're hoping to release in the next month or two, a sister companion to a previous um, publication that the ministry had put out about two years ago on regeneration. And basically, it was uh, a publication that talked about some of the things you may want to consider as service managers when your providers are, um, are looking at possibilities of regenerating. The new edition will have a, which I, as I mentioned, will be out hopefully very soon, will have a little more uh, discussion about there is a, a great opportunity to take a strategic real estate um, assessment of the portfolio as a service manager. Um, you own 55% of all social housing. Some of your housing providers are multi-project uh, sites. Um, there is opportunities to have a hard look at each and uh, every one of those projects and decide 
which ones are coming um, have the greatest possibility of maintaining a strong positive cash flow, and which are the ones that you may want to um, do something else with, uh, either because of location or you're having difficulty renting or the building is not worth renewing. So um, when we release that guide, we'll be able to have more conversations. I'm happy to talk to you about opportunities that you might have. Uh, the only other thing I want to raise is, as I mentioned earlier, on the renewal of the mortgages, which is a function the province has, we recognize there are going to be challenges for us, and we will address them once we figure it out, frankly, that as mortgages are starting to expire, uh, there are 2,900 of them now, there will be considerably fewer of them 10 years from now, and every year the, the number drops. Uh, we're able to go to tender with these bundled mortgages at the time of renewal and get great interest rates because the um, there there is the the total capital value is worth a, a private lender worth a while uh, to bid on it. As the number of mortgages uh, expire, the number the amount of capital we'll be able to put out on the market on a month to month basis on a renewal basis will decrease. So we recognize there might be a point where capital markets will either not continue to show at such favorable rates or there will be a drop in interest, but we will focus on that over the next little while. Um, uh, was there something you wanted to add, Deb, at this yeah, point? I was going to talk a little bit about, um, at the Regional Waterloo, what we're doing around regeneration. Um, as an example to what Eric was mentioning earlier, we have been assessing our own sites. We have about 62 different sites uh, of regionally owned uh, buildings. And we had a team come in to look at uh, which of these sites would be the highest priority for doing uh, regeneration, redevelopment, adding new units, intensification, those kind of things. We have a, a report now back from the, the uh, team and we're analyzing it internally to see uh, what our next steps are and where to start on, on what they've identified as six uh, potential key sites. Now again, you're looking at different kinds of aspects, like the location of the land value um, is really important. We have some sites that are really in very key situations, very close to areas where the land value is increasing. Um, we can use those, we can leverage those sites for more development. Um, there are some of our sites that are reaching end of mortgage sooner than others, so that frees up some opportunities there. And we also have some opportunities when we're adding more units to, to create some income mix. So to make it viable, um, how many market units does it need to have to, to cover off the, the operating costs? So all those things are part of looking at um, your own redevelopment um, opportunities. And at the same time, once the word is out that you're looking at um, this as an interesting idea, as a possibility, you, you start to get uh, inquiries from other sources. Uh, the financial uh, investors are, are out there looking for opportunities, and they're, they're interested to see what they can get involved in, too. So you, you find that um, there are more options out there for how to, how to leverage your, your finances. So that's just an example from the region of Waterloo. Okay, thank you, Deb. I also want to stress, um, it's been our experience that even though you are, uh, as a municipal social housing owner, you have a multi-project portfolio and there are going to be some projects that have a more favorable cash flow than others, it's important, I think it's, I, I want to stress it's important, lenders don't look at this on a portfolio basis. They look on it at a project by project basis. So if you're looking to refinance for a particular project, you really have to know uh, how well that project does in terms of its um, cash flow. It doesn't matter that the project down the street is doing well and that you can offset it with other. Lenders don't operate that way. It's been our experience. And that kind of segues into the very next slide which is talk a bit about Infrastructure Ontario. Infrastructure Ontario, as you may know, has been making available uh, loans to municipalities for quite some time. And in the last couple of years, has broadened their mandate to also provide um, mortgages or loans to, uh, for social housing providers and municipal services managers for social housing. Um, we've seen in the um, projects that they've taken on extremely good in competitive financing.
Um, they've done stuff in Ottawa Community Housing Corporation, Toronto Community Housing Corporation, a number of other places. Um, on the slide, you'll find there is a link included. So if you are wanting to contact IO about uh, discussing specific refinancing opportunities, uh, go to that uh, link. But I will um, give you a heads up. Infrastructure Ontario, like every other lender, is quite stringent in terms of um, measuring the qualifications of that application for financing. So ensuring that you have a revenue stream and the ability to pay the new refinancing costs is very important. And they are going to take a, a, a good look, hard look on the actual cash flow for the specific project. But they have very competitive rates as well. Um, I'd like to pass uh, the uh, next and ongoing slides over to Deb. Yep, thank you. Um, the next slide is around the housing providers and opportunities and challenges that they are facing. So under the new legislation, there is more flexibility for service managers in our relationship with the housing providers. And not all housing pro providers are in the same position. Some, some are doing very well and have managed well and are, are going to be doing well in the future. And others are going to be struggling or have been struggling. And so they're, they're not all dealing with the same, same issues. Some will be uh, in a position where they will need to do some mortgage refinancing. Either they want to do new development or perhaps they have some um, capital reserves, some, some um, repairs to make that they aren't able to, to do with their given capital reserves. So they need to refinance. So there'll, there'll be some differences there. Uh, risk management, we have, we, we know our providers are in, in needing to pay attention to that. Um, capital reserves are very different across the board with across our housing providers. Some have done very well in managing the capital reserves. Some are really at a point where they're, they're, uh, have used them up and they're coming to us as a service manager to ask for some loans to help to do some major capital repairs. So again, there are differences between our housing providers. Um, again, there's some opportunities perhaps in the future as needs change. How do we make sure that the stock that we have really fits the needs of the future? So we have some providers that are saying to us, um, we no longer want to do this business anymore. Or we want to give our assets over to another provider to take care of because they're, they're no longer uh, willing to continue. Each provider has a different level of resources and capacity. Um, you'll find in your own service manager area there is a sense of who's, who's doing well, who's, who needs a lot of help, and who, who is really in a, in a dangerous position of, of where they're needing more, more than just a little bit of help. Um, are they willing to look at new ways of doing business? So how open is the group to, to um, doing things differently? Um, some are, are more adaptable than others. And again, after your agreement ends, um, what is the interest in continuing on? Again, providers may have a different point of view as to for our, our federal um, unilaterals. They're, they're going to some of them are interested in continuing, and some of them are not. So again, having those conversations early is very important. Attracting new board members is, is a struggle for some organizations where they have often the same people who started the, the uh, nonprofit in the first place that are now aging and no longer able to, to continue in that function. Um, how, how capable are they of adding new people to the board, keeping those boards alive and, and functioning well so that they can properly um, manage their properties. I'm going to move on to um, key challenges and opportunities for service managers now. And this is just recapping what was already covered in, in some other areas. But there are some also challenges and opportunities for service managers to, to, to think about and be prepared for. One is around the whole expiring federal funding. So we know, we know what to expect. We know the funding is declining. We know by how much, by when. So being prepared for that, that change and what that means long term for us um, is important to prepare for that. Um, 
as the federal funding declines, what is the cost that we're going to have to put in municipally to, to make up for that? And we're going to have to make sure that our service level standards are being maintained. So how do we make sure, ensure that those, those units are still out there, those affordable units, uh, according to our service level standards? Um, one thing that we're looking at here is that perhaps um, because service level standards are kept overall, um, there's some opportunities maybe of moving some of them around. We have some housing providers that, that um, may be unable to sustain uh, their RGI unit portfolio because they've got maybe 90% of their units are RGI. So being able to move some of those around to make that project more uh, financially sustainable might be uh, something important to do. So that's another, um, as long as your service level standards overall are not changing. The impact of the end of housing subsidies, we're, we're doing a review of all of our housing providers to see which ones will be able to sustain and manage and operate and which ones will be, will be struggling so that we can make sure we have those conversations beforehand with those providers. And we have some opportunities to, to create some new relationships. There might be something very different that we can do in the future as, as some of these groups are, are interested in redevelopment, um, have the potential and the capacity and are, are willing to, to make that investment in the future. So there, these are important conversations to be having now with your housing providers. The next slide really looks at the asset management uh, recap as well. So the buildings themselves, the bricks and mortar, we need to really pay attention to the shape of our buildings. What, what condition are they in? Um, some of our buildings are really going to, as they age, um, need, need significant repairs and maintenance. Um, there's always new things happening, as just recently the carbon monoxide um, the rules around what needs to be there change. Uh, there's more costs that have to be put in place to make sure our buildings are safe and, and meet standards. Location is really critical. And as, as Eric mentioned earlier, sometimes in the early days, um, you, you took whatever land you could that was cheap and affordable. They weren't always in the best locations. Sometimes they're a little far removed. They're not connected by transit or, or other opportunities. So there's some opportunities for sometimes looking at your properties. Which of your properties are are doing well in the right places and which of them are, are not doing well? They can't attract, um, they have difficulty filling vacancies because they're not able to attract new tenants. Um, there's some opportunities to move some, some of these units around in the future as, as, as we mentioned already. Um, we know the demand for affordable housing, social housing, is, is on the increase and will be increasing. So how do we make sure that what we're providing is good quality assets and good quality programs in the right places? We also are very aware that costs are going up. Some of those are, are beyond our control. Um, utility costs. So there are some things we can do around managing some costs, and so how do we make sure that those um, impacts are also managed well? We know that um, there's a number of things that we have to keep our eye on in the future. I want to continue on uh, the next slide around some of the, the flexibilities that we have with the, the legislation. So as a service manager, we now have that responsibility for housing and homelessness prevention together. So that 10-year long-term plan, um, we've got that now in place, but we have to ensure every year that we um, make sure how we're doing on our, our goals and our objectives. How are we reaching those, monitoring our progress? Um, are we making a difference? Are we reducing our homelessness? Are we, are we adding more units of affordability to our, to our housing stock and to our system? So our responsibility is, is quite extensive. Um, 
we need to be looking at all these best practices that are out there and sharing some of those examples across service manager areas that we, we tend to talk to each other and share what are you doing um, that's working well that we can also uh, adapt and, and borrow from you. And that's where the ministry comes in handy in terms of knowing some of those best practices and sharing them across the service manager areas. Um, we know also that there are continued increased needs across the board and we have to work across those different ministries. Um, they all have a little bit of involvement in, in housing. So we've got municipal affairs and housing, we've got the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and we've got the Ministry of Community and Social Services who also have supportive housing that they, they operate and manage. How do we make sure that we're working across those ministries better to coordinate these programs and making sure that on the ground in your community that, that those families and individuals, are, their needs are being addressed. Um, some of the things we're doing here locally, we're, we're starting, uh, it's been a bit of sort of fits and starts, but we're starting now to work better with our local um, health integrated network with our LINs to do some planning together. So sometimes um, there'll be funding coming through their sources, there'll be funding coming through our sources. Right now there's some unique opportunities with homelessness funding, uh, housing funding and some some Lynn um, Ministry of Health funding that are happening at the same time. How do we coordinate who does what so that we can manage what the needs are across our local communities? Um, the last slide really is looking at um, some tools that are out there that we've put together that we think you might be interested in looking at. Some of them are around asset management, so Housing Services Corporation does have some um, material available to help with how do you how do you care for your physical assets and what some tools are and just understanding your end of operating agreement what are what are some things to, to understand about that um, we've also added in some links to um, our national housing organization the CHRA which has some um, studies and some research that they've done on end of operating agreements how do you know um, how well you will be doing in the future at that, at that point. And so there's a number of studies there that you can access that give you a sense of um, some, some groups will do, do fine, um, others will need some help. And lastly, um, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, there's some, some tools there to help with managing, how do you know if you're going to be viable in the future? So there's a viability assessment calculator and they also have their own affordable housing center with some tools and resources available too. So just a, a few places that you can go to to access some, some resources. All right, so um, thank you so much, um, Eric and Aaron, Deb and Elba. Um, you know, this was a great opportunity to get the ball rolling on different um, areas of this um, content. And so I do would like to thank everyone else for joining us on today's webinar. For additional resources on broad range topics, please visit MFOA's virtual library. The library is your one-stop shop for policies, RFPs, guides, legislations, and regulations from across the province. Visit www.mfoa.on.ca forward slash library today. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.